Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We see a lot of you joining us and coming in. My name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm the Senior Acquisitions Editor for the Behavioral Sciences here at Springer Publishing Company. And we're just gonna give you a minute more. We see people coming in and coming in. Uh, we're up to 65 and now 70. So we're gonna wait a minute or two for everybody to join us and then we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm the Senior Acquisitions Editor here at Springer Publishing Company on the Behavioral Sciences. And thank you so much for joining us today. We're just gonna wait maybe one more minute. We see people still coming in and we're gonna get underway in about one minute more. Thank you so much for your time and we will get underway momentarily. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We're gonna get started. Our presentation today is part of our Springer Publishing webinar series is called Equal Access for Students with Disabilities, uh, the Guide for Health Science and Professional Education, second edition. It is part of our book launch today. Um, again, my name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm so excited to have you all today. And we, we wanna thank you for your time. We know how busy uh, this time of year can be. Um, part of today, we're going to be taking questions and, and doing a QA at the conclusion. So if you do have any questions at all, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, in not the chat button, but the Q&A box. Also, this is being recorded. This entire event, event is being recorded and it will be disseminated uh, from us via email in five to seven business days, along with the deck of the presentation that you're seeing today. So in about five to seven business days, you will get the recording. Please feel free to share it with colleagues and pass it on. Um, I'm again, so thrilled today to be welcoming our speakers who are the editors of Equal Access for Students with Disabilities, the Guide for Health Science and Professional Education, second edition. Um, we've got Dr. Lisa Meeks, who's an assistant professor of family medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School and a researcher with the University of California Davis Center for Workforce Diversity. She is also the co-founder and past president of the Coalition for Disability Access in Health Science Education and has served on the board of the Association for Higher Education and Disability, AHEAD. Dr. Meeks was the lead author of the Association of American Medical Colleges Special Report, Accessibility, Inclusion, and Action in Medical Education, the co-creator of the social media campaign, hashtag Docs with Disabilities, and host of the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Her work has been published in leading medical journals and featured in the Washington Post, SIA NBC, Bloomberg Law, AAMC News, and on NPR. We also have Dr. Neer Jain. She's a researcher, rehabilitation counselor, and passionate advocate for disability inclusion in health science education. She's a board member for the Coalition for Disability Access in Health Science Education and has worked as a disability resource professional in health science education for 10 years. She co-authored the 2018 Association of American Medical Colleges Special Report, Accessibility, Inclusion, and Action in Medical Education, colon, Lived Experiences of Learners and Physicians with Disabilities. And then finally, we have Elisa Laird, JD, who has an extensive background in law, disability, and public health. She has worked as a university sign language interpreter and deaf services coordinator, and later as a disability rights attorney and public health 
policy attorney before subsequently returning to work in higher education. She's currently the director of the Disability Resource Center at Samuel Merritt University in Oakland, California, an AHEAD board member and former coalition board member and is a seasoned trainer and presenter. Thank you so much to our speakers. And I also want to thank all the contributing authors that you see here on the screen. All of these folks were very instrumental in producing the new edition. Finally, we want to do a special shout out for the interpreting services donated today by designated interpreters. Um, they are providing that service to us today and for the rest of the book club. And with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Nir Jain. Great. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, this is Nira, and I apologize if I drop out. We're just having some Wi-Fi issues here in New Zealand, so please bear with me. Um, but before I get started, I want to let you know that we're going to give away a signed book during the Q&A, so stay around for that, and we'll um, tell you more about it then. So, Today, we're celebrating the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And this annual event promotes the full and equal participation of people with disabilities and calls on us to take action for disability inclusion in all aspects of society. The theme for um, this day, this year, is building back better toward a disability inclusive accessible and sustainable post COVID-19 world. So what better time for us to consider? And I think we may have lost Nira. I do apologize. We're having some Wi-Fi issues. I think across the world, uh, we had some Wi-Fi shut down in Cleveland, Ohio yesterday. So we'll all be patient. And if she jumps back on, we'll be happy to hear from her. In today's agenda, and this is Lisa Meeks, in today's agenda, we're going to cover several things. We're going to start with what's new in the second edition of this book. We're going to talk about using the guide on your campus. Then we'll move to announcing a really exciting project, the 2021 Virtual Book Club. And finally, we'll leave some time for Q&A. So what's new in the second edition? And I'm really gonna miss my colleague, Dr. Jane right now, because she's so eloquent in the way she describes um, our focus and why we felt it was really important to bring you, the disability resource professionals, um, a new tool for your toolkit. We did a lot, we had a lot of discussion about language in this edition, and it led to some really incredible growth, not only I think for the product, but individually for Elisa, Nira, and I. And we really felt this need to refocus the language to be more centered on the barriers versus a student being an issue. And that also, of course, encompasses situating a problem. So a lot of times in books or discussions, we will situate the student with a disability as being kind of the force that we're having to work around, right? This is the core of the issue. And, and really, these are opportunities to build access. And so we made sure that in the language that, that we used in this version of the book, that we situated everything um, as appropriately shifting the issue and, um, and the solutions to barriers and solutions to remove those barriers. We also shifted the language. Um, we moved from a disability services model to a disability resource model. And in doing so, we recalibrated what we were terming uh, you, the audience, the professional. And so now you'll notice in this version 
that we refer to the disability resource professional versus disability service professional. And um, for short, we'll be referring to that as the DRP throughout our talk today. Then of course, as noted before, we move from the student needs to really the barriers that are present in the environment. We also shift extraordinarily intentionally between identity first and person first language. And I want to, I know Nira's uh, Wi-Fi is, is going in and out, but um, I do want to thank Nira for bringing this to my attention and teaching me. So often Elisa and Nira and I will have these really incredible discussions and we're growing together. And I know that several individuals prefer identity first language and it's a source of pride. And of course, person first identity language has been taught for a long time but neither is incorrect or correct. It's really based on what the individual prefers. And so to honor both schools of thought in this area, what we decided to do was to intentionally move between identity first and person first so that you would be exposed to both. I'm gonna turn it over to Elisa now. Thank you so much, Lisa. So um, in addition to the language updates uh, and framing that Lisa was just describing, another thing that we've done for the second edition is to significantly update the legal content. There are new sections outlining how to set up internal processes for grievances. We've added the numerous OCR and court cases that have come out since the last edition as well. We've also uh, done some work to identify trends that we're seeing in the legal landscape and we've organized some of those trends into tables. I'm going to show you a small example uh, right now of a table. So um, this table lists a few OCR letters that are responding to student complaints to OCR that a faculty member refused to allow an accommodation even though the student was approved for it by the disability office. Things like making audio recordings of class lectures, extending due dates for assignments. If those sound like situations you may have encountered before on your campus, uh, the table also includes direct quotations from OCR about how they viewed that faculty's action. And uh, the book has citations to the case names where each of these came from. This kind of thing can be very helpful to use when you're in conversation with faculty about uh, choices they're making. Um, and there's other new tables of cases and OCR letters in the second edition as well. This is just one example. By popular demand, we also <laughs> added a brand new chapter to this edition entirely focused on technical standards. So it talks about where the term technical standards comes from, how they're most commonly used by programs, it also describes how you can evaluate whether your school's technical standards may contain potentially discriminatory language and some resources for drafting tech standards that are inclusive. But wait, that's not all. I feel like a Ginsu knife commercial. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, ask your parents. Um, so, uh, the second edition contains updates about how to determine accommodations and group work and universal design. Uh, it has expanded discussion about a number of particular kinds of settings, educational settings and disability types. And it includes two brand new sections. There's a guide for students about writing a personal statement when applying for accommodations on licensing exams. And it has a new faculty communication guide, which parallels the student communication guide that was included in the first edition. And finally, there's another new chapter in the book that contains discussion questions about each chapter that you can use to facilitate your own learning or you can use in a discussion group with others. So to talk about more, talk more about how you might use this chapter to facilitate discussions on your campus about improving accessibility, I'm gonna pass the mic back to Lisa. Thank you so much, Elisa. So 
how can you use the guide on your campus? Well, every idea has an origin and I want to start there. Over the course of the last five years, Nira and I would randomly receive emails about the first edition of the guide. And usually these emails were from a DRP asking for permission to use a portion of the book as an educational teaching tool. But then we heard from Laura Pate from San Juan College and Laura took it up a notch. Laura partnered with faculty um, from occupational therapy, in particular, Stacy Wolf, to create a book club and do a national presentation at a conference about their book club. So she states that the book club was a great success and faculty who attended were encouraging other faculty to attend the following semester. When I talked to Laura about it, she said it really built a bridge with the faculty and it was great to help them understand the principles of disability inclusion. Moreover, she was at, actually able to weave this into a professional development opportunity and to give continuing education credits from her institution, which is an idea that we're gonna carry over and suggest to you. So, you know, so many of our ideas, so many of the things that we write come directly from DRPs like yourselves that have ideas. And they're, and so we wanna give credit where credit is due. And we're really, really grateful to Laura and others for this idea. But there are even more creative ways to use the second edition. And I was originally going to turn this over to Nira to talk about it because Nira actually created these ideas. But I don't think she's back on yet. I'm so. back on. Oh, yay. <laughs> I don't know for how long, but I'll try and give it a go. <laughs> I'm so um, grateful. Go ahead. <laughs> great. Thanks, Lisa. So, um, so we were trying to think about more creative ideas of how you might use the book on your campus. So um, a lot of schools have equity book clubs. So this could be a selection that you could put forward for your campuses or your school's equity book club. You could create a training event on a specific topic or something that's more general about disability inclusion and set a chapter or two from the book and then pair it with another publicly available resource. So for example, the AAMC webinars on disability, the 20 minute UCSF faculty training videos, or maybe an episode of Lisa's fantastic Docs with Disabilities podcast. And each of these resources has captions or a transcript and would bring another dimension to the book's content. And in particular, I like the idea of pairing it with the podcast as each episode features a disabled health professional who speaks from their lived experience, which is critical to understanding both the import and possibility of this work. And at the end of the slide deck, you'll find links to those additional resources. So you could also develop faculty tip sheets based on the do's and don'ts chapter, which you'll remember from the last edition, which is now updated. And that summarizes key content from across the book. You could also host a myth busting event based on the myths chapter, which addresses some of the underlying concerns that can get in the way of advancing access. So again, that's a chapter from the previous edition that's now been updated. And I'm sure there's many, many more things people are doing. We'd love to hear from you. Um, tell us how you've used the book or new ways you're using it feel free to email us or pop it into the chat. We're really keen to learn from you and share your experiences with others. Okay, so without further ado, um, we'd like to announce an exciting new project related to the book for 2021, which is the Nationwide Virtual Book Club. Um, and that will begin in January. Um, and a massive thanks to our co-sponsors who are helping to make the book club free and accessible to the public. So those sponsors are the Coalition for Disability Access and Health Science Education, AHEAD, the Association on Higher Education and Disability, 
Springer Publishing, whose fabulous, fabulous marketing team assisted us with making the materials for the events, and of course, designated interpreters who will provide captioning. So now we'll turn it over to Lisa to tell you more about how that will work. Great, thank you so much, Nira. I'm so glad you're back. Now, let's chat a moment about the format of the book club. And of course, it's going to be delivered remotely. We have catalyzed authors from the book and some additional national leaders who will serve as co-moderators as denoted by the population picture that is on the slide. There will be two moderators for each chapter. And the webinar logo next to it shows that we will deliver a monthly webinar. It's going to start in January with webinar one that will cover chapter one and the discussion questions that um, were assigned to chapter one. The webinars will run the, the entire year, 2021, with one chapter being delivered each month. Now, this network of folks from across the nation and even the world um, include you and your colleagues. Approximately 500 of you will join the webinar. And as these conversation bubbles on the screen suggest, the goal will be to create a national dialogue about inclusion. The moderators are truly only there to moderate. So we encourage you to review the questions in advance and be ready to tell us what you do on your campus. Tell us your stories and tell us your ideas. This is meant to be the ultimate form of crowdsourcing. So what are the benefits of the book club? Well, I see three distinct benefits. One is denoted by this pad and lots of people is access to a national community of peers. Of course, as you see with the bubble and the two individuals, these tools and our conversations are gonna be focused on health professions education exclusively. So that includes everyone, medicine, nursing, OT, PT, pharmacy, dentistry, and the list goes on and on. And then, as you can see in this little certificate, there's an opportunity to use the book club as a form of professional development for your teams. So we're going to talk about that one in just a bit. While Laura Pate gave us some great ideas about how she ran her book club, that was back in, I think, 2020 when people were meeting in person. So we're going to give you a few ideas about how to uh, utilize the book club remotely. And I imagine that you all can come up with a myriad of uses. And remember, we did get this idea from a disability resource professional. So we're going to offer two models here. But I really, as Nira said, I really, really encourage you to feel free to reach out to us with other ideas. And what we'll do is we'll have an idea section on our book club website. And we'll post all of your ideas, of course, giving everyone credit where credit is due. So idea one would be for the disability resource professional to attend the book club themselves and then to replicate the book club on their campus with their campus representatives. So that could be administrators, assistant deans of programs, or your faculty. And you could use this as a professional development training. Now, a little, a little tip, contact the person in charge of CEUs at your institution and find out whether you can use this as an actual CEU granting or CME granting event. That will really help spark people's interest because they do have to get those CEUs and none of us are really attending conferences right now. So idea number two would be for you, the DRP, to go ahead and just invite your campus representatives to attend the National Book Club with you. And what you could do is make it a two hour block. You could attend the book club together and then you could use the second hour and under a separate Zoom link to debrief and have a discussion about items that are specific to your campus and what you're seeing on your campus. 
Okay. As you might imagine, there's a lot of information about the book club, including those discussion questions, the time that the book club meets, who the facilitators are for each chapter, and importantly, how do you register? Well, We've developed a website that contains all of the items you're going to need for the full year. And as we move through the year, we'll also be um, investigating mechanisms for growing the discussion, perhaps through listservs. And given that some of the topics may be of more interest to you than others, we've designed the registration process such that you can register for each month individually. So if you're only interested in some discrete topics, you only have to register for those months. This allows you as the attendee to pick and choose the topics that you wish to engage in. So please be sure to head over to the website, which is bit bit.ly slash the guide book club. And each month has a limited number of spots. There are only 500 spots for each month. So you can go on over there today and register. All right. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our wonderful Springer colleagues. Hello. Thank you for that. So as you can see here, there's a discount code available to save 25% plus free shipping in the United States. The book is available now on our website. And for bulk purchases, if you're looking to purchase for your own book club or any large quantities for any events or anything like that, you can contact our new business development manager, Lee Montbill, at the email address you see on your screen. Um, if you are interested in looking to adopt this for a course, for a rehabilitation counseling course, or any other kind of course, uh, you can contact your Springer sales representative at the address you see on your screen. We're also here today to promote our journals. Uh, since we do publish a couple of journals that might be of interest to this audience, uh, we are providing some links here. And you'll also, again, in about five to seven business days, be getting this recording sent to you via email. I mentioned it at the start of the event, but for those of you who joined us a little bit late, this entire event is being recorded uh, the deck that you see will be included as well as the recording of this event that you can share with colleagues and all of this information, the links to our journals and so on and so forth is included. Okay, we're going to take some questions. Um, so I'm going to start here, ladies, with, uh, hi, I'm enjoying this webinar. Would you consider dyslexia under a disability? What might be available for people with it? Lisa, can you hear that? I can, thank you. I was just giving every, anyone else who wanted to answer uh, an opportunity. And of course, uh, dyslexia would be considered a disability and so would be under reading disorders in the book. And we actually have some examples that discuss dyslexia um, specifically in the clinical setting. So there are some great resources in the text uh, specific to being in a clinical setting, especially for those learners that have dyslexia. And I'm happy to answer, if you have a more specific question, I'm happy to answer it. Um, I, I do see, I, I will, hmm. The link is not working. Okay, yeah, that, that's going one of to, the next questions. Yeah, that I'll check on that about. right now. Maybe Nira and Elisa could answer the next few questions. But I also wanted to remind everybody that we're going to do the drawing. And so I don't know if we want to do that first. And I can sure check on the link. Yeah. So the the link uh, will have an answer to that question. We've just put the correct link in, and I'll put it in one more time. Sorry about that. That's my error. Thanks so much. So do you want to bring that up on the screen then what the correct link is? I won't be able to do that because I'm sharing my screen, 
But okay. um, but I believe Nira said she just put it in the chat. Is that correct, Nira? Why don't you just read it out loud what it, it, what is. it is? Okay, oh, yeah. sure. It's HTTP colon backslash backslash B-I-T dot L-Y backslash uh, the guide book club, all one word. Maybe repeat it one more time. Sure. H-T-T-P colon backslash backslash B-I-T dot L-Y dash the guide book club, all one word. And then... Uh, hi, back to George in New Zealand. And the book will be available on the AHEAD website. I believe our amazing book uh, connoisseur Lee is working with AHEAD to carry the book as they did with the first edition. Yes. And we did, I will answer the, this other question, uh, OCR rulings that are in the table, they are cited in the book. So you'll be able to go to all of those. Okay. Well, the, uh, the tables are actually excellent. And I was going to thank Elisa and just really call out Elisa's incredibly hard work to bring the last six years of cases to people in a digestible format. We were really lucky to have Elisa join us as an editor on this edition. We've got another question uh, from Elise Gaithier. I hope I'm pronouncing your name. Uh, at least properly, with universities moving to creating policies providing more accessible online instruction, what areas need to be included in such newer policies? Lisa or Nira, anyone want to answer that one? I'm not sure if we've lost Nira again. Could you reread the question? Sure. With universities moving to creating policies for providing more accessible online instruction, what areas need to be included in such newer policies? Oh, goodness. That's a big question. Uh, I, I think we're, we're really discovering that as we go, right? We're all... Uh, this is all very new, especially in the world of health science, professional education. It's completely new for many of us. So I would say, you know, I can't, I can't give a definitive list of policies because I think that there are things that I, I had a meeting yesterday where we discovered one more thing. And I also am a little hesitant, and Elisa, feel free to jump in, but I'm a little hesitant to rush to creating policies right away because I think so many times, um, we, in creating a policy, we don't think about the impact on uh, multiple marginalized groups with the creation of a policy. So, you know, I know we're, we're aiming to do something for good, but we have to think kind of about the ripples that that will have with other students. So I think that little policies, for example, one of the policies is that you have to um, check in, you know, there's this whole kind of protocol for checking in before you go into a clinical setting. And it created very long lines. And in some cases, it could create long lines in, you know, outside spaces. And so you have to think about how that's going to impact individuals that have to get up early to, you know, manage a disability related event or that cannot stand for long periods of time? And how does that policy impact that student? So that's just one example, but um, of interest, I don't know, you know, one of the things that we have done is we've created a, a working group and it's called AIM, Access and Medicine. And we actually have our first meeting next week. And this group's sole purpose is to look at barrier specific to COVID changes or to changes due to COVID, I guess, to be more exact, and to try to create guidance for schools on the necessary changes, especially with the clinical curricula. So I think there's lots and lots of policies, but the, the rush to create policies it really worries me because so many times they're, they're really myopic in their focus and we fail to see how it might impact students negatively. So 
That's my I'll two just, cents. I'll, this is Elisa. I'll just jump in and add that, um, you know, when, when everything switched to online in the spring, um, we all had to just go into firefighting mode. And I imagine that was the same, at least for you and others as well. And so we had to, um, now we have an opportunity to step back and be a little more thoughtful. And I think maybe that's what you're asking is what do we do to make sure that our online instruction is, you know, is more inclusive and um, isn't creating unnecessary barriers for students with disabilities. So I really strongly encourage you to ask your question on the ahead listserv or the coalition listserv, um, because I think you'll get a lot of input from a lot of schools around the country who have uh, already been working on this. So we don't have to all reinvent the wheel as we're um, faced with these brand new challenges of online instruction that we, uh, didn't really necessarily all have at this scale in the past. Right, Thank I, you. Can, I can tell you that some things in the assistive technology uh, section chapter, that was actually being written and big thanks to Mike Kenny and Grace Clifford and Linda Sullivan and, and all the others that contributed to that chapter. As we were in the middle of writing it, some of the, the impact of COVID had already started and we did address as much as we could about these changes in that chapter on assistive technology. Thanks, ladies. I'm going to take another question while we're, we have time. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. I'm going to try to combine two into one. We had an anonymous attendee ask, do you address accommodations for licensing exams such as NCLEX in the book? And then also, is there any content or chapters regarding preparation for licensing exams, i.e. use of extended time while in health science programs for written exams? Uh, or is there a time or period when extended time is reasonable during the PE? I can um, start answering this one and then happy for Lisa and Elisa to jump in. So yes, we do talk about um, accommodations for licensing exams. In particular, what we focus on is the role of the disability resource professional in supporting the student to request accommodations because of course the decision making for licensing exams happens um, by those licensing boards. Um, so what we provide advice on is putting together the application, supporting students to make that application kind of timelines. And as Elisa mentioned earlier, we have a new um, checklist for personal statements for those kinds of applications. So to answer that, we do address that. And then for the second part, um, asking about extended time, I believe was the question. I'm just trying yeah. to find the question. For students um, in health professional programs who go out on clinical, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. But yes, it was about extended time for licensing exams, use of extended time while in the health science program for written exams, not PE. Yeah. Or is there a time period when extended time is reasonable? Okay, so I'm not sure what PE means, so maybe you can clarify that if um, or maybe Virginia, you, you were the Virginia was the person asking that question. Virginia Martz. So I'm not sure what PE means, but we do talk about physical um, exams. Oh, physical she exams. says. So we do talk about extended time. There's a clinical accommodations chapter where we talk about um, extended time for all kinds of exams, including things like OSCEs and, um, and written exams as well. So yeah, that's something that's covered in the book, just talking about decision-making for those kinds of things. Okay, we have another question from Cindy Poor Pariso. I hope I'm pronouncing your name close uh, to what it, how it is to be pronounced. What is the biggest change you incorporated into the new updated text, the biggest change? Oh gosh, I, <laughs> that's a great question, Sin. Um, that's a hard question to answer though, because I, I would say the biggest overall change is the language and how everything was situated. And we did that to model how a DRP might have a conversation with faculty and to bring faculty into a space that's more barrier oriented and universal design focused. And so I would say that, but having said that, I can't say that the, the, the faculty guide, 
uh, written by Allison May and Nira and uh, Christine Lowe and myself. It, it was something that was actually asked for by you, the, the audience, the purchaser. Everyone loves the student guide because it's a separate resource in that appendices that you just hand out to students. You know, and it's really helpful, at, but I think everyone needs help in communication and faculty don't know what they don't know. And so this kind of um, sibling uh, appendices in the chapter on communications is really valuable for your faculty to help them better understand how their communication might be perceived. Um, I think it could be really helpful too in mitigating some of those awkward conversations that are occurring that shouldn't occur between faculty and students. And so it's it's really a, a resource and a support, not only for the faculty, but my gosh, for you DRPs out there who are trying to really teach faculty the best way to communicate around disability related matters. I don't know, Nira, Elisa, what would you say? I think it's hard, you know, that's a hard question to answer because um, we changed a lot and it feels like you know, while the core of the book is still there, we've, we've really updated the entire text. So um, I wouldn't, it's really hard to put a finger on that. I think the things that we highlighted in the presentation really um, touch on some big changes, but really the entire book has updates throughout. Okay, um, we have time maybe for a couple more questions. We have one from Megan Hearns. Is there any information regarding national resources and organizations statewide question? So I can answer that um, just to begin. Hi, Megan. Um, we have a whole list in the book of um, organizations that are doing this work specifically regarding health science, education and disability access. Um, so yep, there is a list in the book Lisa, are you thinking of anything else or Elisa? No, just the, the chart and some new resources that are more social media oriented, which are really helpful. Yeah, and as far as statewide, there are ahead affiliates in most states um, and there's other, um, there may be other state uh, focused resources, but we couldn't really include all 50 states more local resources in the book, um, but certainly, um, you know, asking your peers in your state for what they're using and um, yeah, is a good resource to start with. Okay, and uh, an anonymous attendee asked, we have a nursing program that is not allowing accommodations for case note patient records portions of the clinical patient encounter exams, but other programs do. Do you have any information that we can refer to? I, this oh. is Elisa, I can, I can tackle that. Um, so um, that's frustrating and I'm sorry that you're experiencing that. Um, it is my understanding that it's fairly common, as you say, for most schools to allow extended time for written or read parts of an exam, even if it's a patient encounter. Uh, the rest of it is a patient encounter based on the fact that a student who has limitations on reading or writing in an exam setting would also have the same limitations on reading or writing uh, in a patient encounter exam for the, for the patient notes portion. So um, there is information in the book about that. Um, and then there's also sort of power in numbers. So um, being able to, to say that other schools are doing that is, a, um, is often persuasive. Um, to faculty to show that they're an outlier. Lisa or Nira, do you want to add anything to that? I would just add the article that we wrote about OSCEs that is out there. And I cannot remember the name of it, Nira, if you remember the name of it. But the one in disability compliance in yeah. higher education? Yes. Um, I can try and pull the reference and put it in the chat. Let me see if I can do that. Yeah, so I, you know, I love Elisa's, uh, well, first of all, I, I agree with Elisa. I'm so sorry you're going through that. And that is not the national norm. And I do think there is power in numbers and letting people know, you know, that other schools are doing that as, and it's part of the national 
you know, kind of normative uh, behavior and that when something becomes a standard practice, it's going to be very hard to justify and or defend not doing it when it's clear that it is doable. Um, but I would also say that faculty and, you know, I'm a faculty member myself, and we're all guilty of this. Somehow there's this magic fairy dust that goes over something when it's been published. And we seem to think that because it's been published and peer reviewed that something, there's something magical about it. And, um, and so I, I always encourage a DRP to, uh, go to the conversation with some printed materials, with some things that a faculty member can read and to let them know, you know, this is what's happening. Um, these are some, some examples of, of what's been written up in the literature. So I think, you know, maybe a twofold approach where you have both kind of the national standard and you can get some examples of this on the listserv. The coalition listserv is a lifeline where you can ask other professionals what their practices are and bringing kind of near peer institution practices to the table and then you know supplementing that with the written um, articles so okay. just popped that link into um, the chat the chat so the the link is in the chat to that um, to that query um, we're going to try to to end up with the last couple of questions here, one from Heather Feldner, for students in health professions programs, for example, PT or OT, who go out on clinical experiences and may need accommodations in the clinic, how do we best advocate for the student if the clinical site is resistant to making accommodations? I think Neera, you had said you'd want to answer that particular question. I'm happy to answer it, but I'm wondering actually if Elisa would like to, sure, would prefer to answer. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is certainly something that has come up lots of times, um, and there is there have been some uh, cases about this. Um, it has been determined that the school is ultimately responsible for ADA compliance, um, even if it's the clinical site that's failing to um, provide accommodations. So um, we as the school need to, are, are legally obligated to ensure that uh, our students are not experiencing disability related barriers in violation of the ADA when we're sending them out to clinical sites um, that we have chosen and we have partnered with uh, as a school. So um, and then it gets tricky how you actually accomplish that in real life. I understand that. And the relationships with clinical sites are often fragile and, um, and very competitive. So um, I understand there are a lot of competing things um, going on there. And that's an awful lot for us to be able to tackle in this one minute that we have left. But, um, but yeah, so um, certainly, that is, that is the obligation. Uh, Nira, do you wanna add anything else? No, you got it. Okay, um, I think we have one more question, I'm trying to find it. Uh, that might be all the questions actually. So I think we want to announce Am I right? We want to announce the winner of the free giveaway of the book. Is everybody ready for that? Um, Amber Chess. Congratulations. Thank you all for your time today. Thank Amber, you. Why don't and you um, email me or um, would that be best everyone if we have Amber email me with her contact information? Sure. And we'll give a big shout out to Northwell, which is where Amber is. So Amber, uh, R. Dearborn at springerpub.com. And I'll put it in the chat. And then I will work with getting you that copy. And I just want to say, um, as at the end, and I'm sure Elisa and Nira have something to add as well. We are so grateful to all of the disability resource professionals. Um, we, as we went through and rewrote this book, it was a labor of love and just really trying to 
think about you and the work that you're doing and the tools that you need. And we had so many colleagues, as you saw on that first slide, that you know, just helped inform the book and were wonderful colleagues to work with. So we thank our co-authors, but we really thank you because you're in the trenches doing this tough work. And I can't even begin to imagine how difficult uh, your job, which was already difficult, has been in the middle of a pandemic. And you're amazing individuals and you all deserve a raise. I wish I could give you all a raise, but um, you, you're very, you're incredible individuals doing really, really important work. And we hope that this tool will be helpful to you. And I don't know, Nira and Elisa, if you want to add anything. No, thank you all. Um, and we hope you enjoy the book. Yeah, and I just want to, we had another question just about the ability to get this presentation. And once again, uh, this entire presentation is being recorded and it will be disseminated in five to seven business days via email. Uh, for those of the folks who signed up and were not able to attend live, it will be ma mailed out to everybody who registered um, along with the deck that you see here uh, in a PDF. So that will go out as well. Um, I wanna thank all of our speakers today. I wanna thank all of you who attended and, and spent about uh, almost an hour of your time with us, which we know is very, very valuable. So with that, Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.